Building bigger arms is hands down the most common goal among gym goers. And if you're anything like me and struggle with less than amazing biceps and triceps genetics, then listen up. Because in this video, I'll be sharing five science-based tips that will essentially force your arms to grow no matter how stubborn they've been. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Tip number one, hit them from different angles. Your main elbow flexors are comprised of two muscles, the biceps brachii and the brachialis. The biceps brachii is most effective at elbow flexion when the elbow is fully extended or close to it. In contrast, the brachialis, the muscle underneath your biceps, has the greatest leverage in full elbow flexion or when the arms are bent. Since the elbow is a hinge joint, it only moves in one plane. That said, the only way to shift the emphasis from one muscle to the other is by modifying your range of motion. One study published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research saw that training the biceps within 50 to 100 degrees of elbow flexion increased muscle thickness of the elbow flexors. In another more recent study, using 80 to 130 degrees of elbow flexion also significantly increased muscle thickness of the elbow flexors. These results then support the notion that one can preferentially activate either the biceps brachii or the brachialis. Thus, I recommend limiting your range of motion by performing partials to bias one elbow flexor group over the other. Training both the top and bottom half of the range are viable options. Another way of emphasizing the different elbow flexors is by varying your forearm orientation. According to this study, published in the Journal of Neurophysiology, doing curls with a supinated grip will target the biceps brachii to a greater degree Degree, while a pronated or neutral grip curl will target more of the brachialis. Unlike the elbow flexors, your elbow extensors are solely made up of one muscle group, the triceps brachii. The triceps brachii consists of three heads, the long head, lateral head, and the medial head. The main function of the triceps is elbow extension or straightening out the arm. Anytime we extend the forearm at the elbow joint, all three triceps heads are active. The long head of the triceps, which also happens to be the biggest and meatiest of the three, also helps to extend the shoulder joint or bring the arm behind the body due to its origin on the scapula. Thus, training your triceps with shoulders at zero degrees of elevation or arms by your sides, and even more so when the arms go behind your body, will produce the most muscle force from the long head. Training your triceps with shoulders between 90 and 180 degrees, however, will shift more of the focus to the lateral and medial heads. So, if you want to maximize triceps growth, I recommend including at least one exercise where you're training your triceps with arms down and by your sides, such as a traditional rope pushdown, as well as one exercise where you're between 90 and 180 degrees of shoulder elevation, such as a skull crusher or overhead triceps extension. You see, by simply changing the angle and orientation of your arms, you can work different muscle fibers and bring a new stimulus to your muscles, promoting further growth. Tip number two, lift heavier weights. According to this stimulating reps model, all rep ranges five and above will produce the same levels of muscle growth when training to or close to failure. The reason for this is simple. Mechanical tension, the primary driver of muscle growth, can be achieved at any rep range. You see, mechanical tension occurs when there is an involuntary slowing of rep speed and a high level of motor recruitment, and achieving this only requires that you take your set to failure or close to it. Therefore, the final reps of any set to failure, regardless of the weight on the bar, are the hypertrophy stimulating reps. 
The problem with higher rep ranges, however, is that they produce greater fatigue within the muscle fibers. And the more fatigue is present, the fewer muscle fibers you're able to recruit for the next set, resulting in less muscle fibers experiencing mechanical tension. That said, I recommend starting your workout with some heavier arm training where you're lifting in the 5 to 8 rep range. The heavier the weights you start with, assuming it's not so heavy that it affects your form, the sooner you'll get those stimulating reps. Starting your workout with lighter weights will require far more reps before reaching failure, a recipe for greater fatigue and less hypertrophy stimulus. So, while getting a pump and feeling the burn in your arms feels great, giving the muscle just enough stimulus to recover from before the next workout is much more important than forcing blood into the muscle. Tip number three, less is more. Contrary to popular belief, compared to all major muscle groups, the biceps and triceps have some of the slowest recovery rates. It's no surprise then that studies have consistently shown that training the biceps with less frequency results in better gains over time. One study published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research compared muscular adaptations when training three times per week versus six times per week. They showed that training your biceps three times per week resulted in greater muscle growth than training them twice as much. Another 2018 study comparing training a muscle group once per week versus twice per week with volume being equal found that one session per week produced greater growth in the elbow flexors than two sessions. So while it's tempting to spend time doing bicep curls at the end of your workout for a nice pump, this additional volume volume could be doing more bad than good. You see, after a workout, muscles experience fatigue for a few days, and the main compound that causes fatigue and muscle damage is calcium ions. Every time you contract a muscle, more calcium ions accumulate within the muscles. The mitochondria then defends the muscle fibers from the fatiguing effects of these calcium ions, and this shielding effect is even greater with slow twitch fibers than it is with fast twitch fibers. But since the biceps and triceps are made up of mostly fast twitch fibers, they are more easily damaged during training, resulting in slower recovery rates. To put it simply, when it comes to training your arms, less is sometimes more. Tip number four, track your progress. While it's likely that you're actively tracking your squat, bench, and deadlift numbers, you probably don't have a log of your weight, sets, and reps for your biceps curls. But the principle of progressive overload doesn't just apply to strength building, it also applies to hypertrophy training. You see, after working out, the body responds to the stimulus of the workout, and the recovery period gives it time to adapt to the stress you put it through, making the muscle bigger and stronger in order to handle this same stress again later. If, however, you're not gradually increasing that stimulus over time, your body will have no reason to respond to the stress it is already adapted to. To ensure you're providing enough stress for your muscles to continue growing, you can either increase the weight you're lifting without sacrificing volume, or you can increase the volume without sacrificing load. According to this recent study by Schoenfeld and colleagues, both methods are viable strategies for enhancing muscular adaptations. So, if you're serious about building bigger arms, then it's critical that you start tracking your progress even with these comparatively small lifts. Personally, I recommend a progression model known as double progression. The way it works is quite simple. If the workout prescribes a rep range of 8 to 12, your goal is to complete each set for the maximum number of reps, which in this example is 12. Once you're able to complete every set for the maximum number of reps, then and only then you'll increase the weight slightly and repeat. Not only does this ensure that you're pushing hard enough to stimulate new growth, but having these small goals set for each gym session will likely increase your motivation to train. And tip number five, eat to grow. 
Proper nutrition plays a vital role in building muscle and achieving sleeve busting arms. To ensure that your body has the nutrients necessary for muscle growth, you must achieve two things. First, you must consume enough protein. According to this study from the Nutrients Journal, muscle protein synthesis is stimulated in a dose-dependent manner. In other words, more protein equals higher muscle protein synthesis rates, at least to a degree. So it doesn't matter how hard you train in the gym, if you're not consuming enough protein, you'll never build muscle. The common consensus across protein and hypertrophy studies is one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. And second, you should aim for a small caloric surplus where you're consuming slightly more calories than you're burning. And while building muscle is possible when eating at maintenance or even in a deficit, a surplus of calories creates a favorable environment for muscle growth. That's why I recommend you aim to consume about 250 to 500 calories above maintenance while also ensuring you're getting at least one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Remember, training is only half the battle and it can't be won unless you're eating enough to support muscle growth. So there you have it. Five science-based tips to force muscle growth in your arms. Implement some or all of these tips and feel as your shirt sleeves begin to get tighter over time. Did you find this video helpful? If so, click the like button below as it'll truly help out the channel. And if you're enjoying the content and want to support the channel, all we ask is that you click the subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you never miss another video. Peace.